As we celebrate Ocean Ma, women's health plays a really important role. To talk about this, joining us is a very senior expert. We have Poonam Madreja. She's the executive director of Population Foundation of India. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. You know, we all know women's health is really important, but somewhere it is really neglected. Why do you think so? So um, many of us think women's health is important, but clearly in a patriarchal society, um, there is every sign and symptom that women's health by families, by even um, at the political level, unfortunately, um, is not seen as important. And this has to do with not individuals in the political sphere. It is to do, it's a reflection of our society where social norms are heavily weighted against women. Um, women uh, are not only neglected where it comes to health, but their other well-beings, education, literacy rates, if you look at employment, everywhere we see that women are lagging behind. Though whenever women are given capable opportunities, women show capabilities beyond expectations. So I'd like to say that it is to do with the social status of a woman in the country. And, you know, it is the way women are socialized and men are socialized, how we bring up our children. It's we give importance to the boys. You know, if there is if there is a little food in the household, girls and women will eat the last and the least, while men will uh, and the boys they have an advantage, which both uh, they have the privilege from both men as well as women. You know, it is women who practice patriarchy and women's self-perception of their health and well-being needs to be um, brought into the sphere of feeling equal, feeling important. And we don't recognize that women, you know, it should be an absolute shame for India that so many women, 24%, almost of, or should we say one fourth of women in India are malnourished and 54% of women are anemic. And you know, when women are anemic um, and undernourished, we, we, it's not that society doesn't see undernourished women producing undernourished babies. But again, it's the lack of, I think it's more to do with uh, social issues. Her, um, you know, I always say if behind a woman's every health issue is a samajic issue. Problem. Yes, yes. I think you put it so well, like you were saying. You were yourself talking about samajic issues, but the intergenerational cycle, ki agar hum baat kare, Poonamji, how yeah. do we break this cycle? Because there's anemia, hai, malnutrition. It's not that women are born with poor health. लेकिन ये जो साइकिल होता है आप देखते हैं कि बार-बार बच्चे जैसे बोर्न होते हैं मदर मैलनरिस्ट होती है या अनीमिक होती है तो बच्चा भी ऑब्वियसली अंडरवेट या वीक होगा तो हम इस साइकिल को कैसे तोड़ें सो दिस साइकिल कैन बी ब्रोकन एंड इट हैज बीन ब्रोकन इन अदर कंट्रीज और इट डजंट एग्जिस्ट इन अदर कंट्रीज सो व्हाट वी नीड इज a healthy girl, a healthy adolescent, we need a healthy mother, we need to invest in their um, in their portion, we need to invest in unke, unke sirah swasthi ke liye nahi, par unko kapushan, kapushan dur karne ke liye, unke liye, we need to have state subsidy. Honestly, we need more food subsidy for the poorest women because the the poorer you are, the more likely you are to be anemic or undernourished. And intergenerational cycle is very not only cost lives for women. Mm. Maternal health gets affected. High maternal mortality, high child mortality is the outcome. And more than that, the children, little infants are born undernourished. And these undernourished infants also have a heart and are susceptible to many other diseases. So how do we end all this? First of all, we have to recognize it. You know, um, India has to be feel a sense of shame, if I may say so, 
uh, about the fact that we have so many children being born into this uh, country uh, where they don't have a chance for survival and if they have a chance for survival you know they men- they their mental well-being gets affected their mental health gets affected so they are never able to cope and uh, with even opportunities of education and jobs given to them so there are many things we need to do so let me start with first the nutrition we need to feed yeah. we absolutely need to feed our uh, girls and women well we need to eradicate we have to make a commitment to eradicate eradicate um uh um not just anemia but malnutrition amongst our children and our girls mm-hmm. we need better feeding programs than we have today for girls in schools for all children in school i am not i don't want wish to discriminate against boys yeah. who are undernourished ye hame yaad rakhna chahiye ki sirf ladkiyan nahi boys bhi undernourished hain to hame dono ke ko apni nazar mein rakhte hue सबको स्कूल्स में और आंगनवाड़ी प्रोग्राम्स हमें उनको इवैल्यूएट करके कैसे इम्प्रूव करना है दूसरा लड़कियों की जब जल्दी शादी होती है तो उनके बच्चे भी जल्दी होते हैं क्योंकि जो 14 साल 13 साल की उम्र में या 18 साल से नीचे उम्र में जब लड़कियों की शादी होती है ये देखा जाता है कि उनके पास कॉन्ट्रसेप्टिव एक्सेस नहीं होती टू कॉन्ट्रसेप्टिव फैमिली प्लानिंग ना ही उनको नॉलेज होती है और दूसरा वो काम बहुत करती हैं और दे एक्सपीरियंस वायलेंस आल्सो ऑल दिस अफेक्ट्स दे मेंटल फिजिकल एंड इमोशनल वेलबींग तो इसलिए वी हैव टू मेक श्योर नो गर्ल बिलो द लीगल एज ऑफ एटीन गेट्स मैरिड and the best way to do that is also to keep them in schools and the goal of keeping girls in schools isn't just uh, only so that they don't get married it is for their future and investment yes. and third we have to make sure that women have good menstrual hygiene you know a lot of the lack of management of menstrual um uh, periods of women lead to often excessive bleeding or irregular periods then infections it leads to infections which further jeopardize a woman's health fourth i'd like to say that women need access to family planning so that they have children at the right time and fewer children we need to postpone the first child we need spacing between two children because that is what really impacts a woman's uh, well being not just health again and they're all linked women's mental physical emotional uh, well being so we have to um, uh, have health services respond to that you know family planning i mentioned 36% of uh, no sorry 13% of girls in india or women in india who wish to have fewer children and do not wish to have a third child end up having a third and even fourth child yes. and the percent is very high because mm-hmm. either they don't have access to family planning or they don't have the agency and autonomy in fact you've explained that really well that what we can do to break this cycle obviously because that's how you know when we really looking at a healthy population you know of course nutrition we've been talking about it it's portion ma we all know that nutrition is important you know all the menstrual hygiene is very important Ma- early marriage is a big problem and a challenge but what you said about family planning uh, you know and access to contraceptive is critical in fact i was reading that female sterilization is the most common method 75 more than 75% whereas male sterilization is easy to do uh, and barely 1% of people actually do it so what are your thoughts on that do you think we need to change this thinking totally but it is i can tell you it's very difficult uh, there is a myth and misconception men have that if they get sterilized their virility will be reduced and men are so obsessed with their virility it is unbelievable that therefore that leads or gets converted into only 0.3% men mm-hmm. getting vasectomy while it's 75% yes. uh, for women and you know second thing about men is that they they think it is 
a woman's responsibility. Family planning is woman's responsibility. The burden and privilege. I think women are very privileged to be biologically superior or advantage to be giving birth yes. to a yes. life. Okay, Absolutely. and. Um, so I I do not wish to at all insinuate that poor mm -hmm. women are women are very privileged. So let's mm -hmm. respect them for yes, their capability yes. and ability and give them all the support. And mm -hmm. we need to change the mindset of not just men but our policymakers, our influencers. You know I have tried very hard to get men. Uh, eminent men, um, uh, people who are, um, um, you know, uh, have, are influencers in many parts, uh, different industry to talk about family planning. And do you know, even old men, older men refuse to, they still want to have that image as a stud, which they think comes in the way of um, um, them, um, you know, their image if they talk about family planning. So family planning has to become, a, for men has to become a, a, a societal uh, responsibility. You know, family planning is not a, is a women's issue. It's equally a men's issue. Yes, yes, and I'd like to say um, that it is a societal issue. Society needs to take this head on and change, you know, once you change social norms and you explain to men, or maybe we should have the kind of even financial incentives haven't worked. But I do believe that if we do massive campaigns and people in positions of influence can address men, you know, a prime minister, when he addresses people, to give up uh, subsidy for uh, cooking gas cylinders. People do listen. A lot of people seem to be listening to the prime minister, our current prime minister. I would love to see people at his level, his leadership, yeah. uh, uh, persuade men. And second, I want to make a very sad point here, share some data with you, that you know, women who experience uh, sterilization 77% of them have never been through family planning. What do they do then? Most of them end up having abortions as a proxy for family planning, which is so sad. Look, what I am hell? for abortion as a right, but mm. not the risk of having endless abortions uh, instead of family planning. And, uh, you know, um, we need temporary methods. We need to bring in and we government has to stop focusing only on sterilization. You know, there are incentives for sterilization that women get, the families love it. They get a reasonable amount of money and so do service providers. And even though India does not have a policy which is focused on sterilization, but somehow the mindset. So we need to change mindsets and we need to give importance to family planning to change the mindsets because it will have an impact on all aspects, poverty, literacy, nutrition. Um, it'll, it'll impact India and it'll bring down our expenditure on health um, in a big way. So family planning, like you've just said, it is very, very critical. We need to change mindset. Another thing uh, which you did mention is sometimes a lady or a woman doesn't want to have so many kids, but she you know, has to have three or four. What are your thoughts on the two child norm? Uh, do you think how would that be for women in the country? Do you think do you see it happening? Uh, should it happen? You know, India doesn't need a two child norm. And let me explain to you why we don't need a two child norm. And then I'll explain why it's not mm -hmm. going to be good for mm -hmm. women. Fertility is declining very fast in India in mm -hmm. much of the states. So 20 states already have replacement level fertility which means that, uh, you know, the numbers will remain constant. Um, we will not have an increase in numbers if we reach le replacement level. Second, I want to say that in India, women and families don't wish to have more than two children. So women and families don't wish to have more than two, don't wish to have more than two children. What is the problem? The problem is lack of access to family planning services and women don't have the authority, autonomy or agency to decide. 
So we need to empower women. We need to give them access to temporary methods or any method that suits her at different periods of time. Because women's bodily uh, needs keep changing. Mm -hmm. And uh, given their hormonal uh, changes uh, uh, at different stages, which is adolescence, menopause, in the middle of um, uh, having... Uh, Babies, the, the, the hormonal imbalance, or should we say hormonal changes, in, uh, determine which family planning method will, use, uh, will be most useful. You know, most countries have many more family planning methods than India. So if we provide temporary methods, women will not have to depend only on sterilization and have endless yes, children yeah. in the meantime, or abortions. Second, women do we, 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 women don't have autonomy and authority, as I have repeated three times. But it is important, so it keeps coming up in my um, uh, narrative and conversation. So what it will do is, even those women who wish to have two children or one child, because they have, are forced to have a third child, especially if they haven't had a son, or because nobody cares about family planning. Um, uh, or their health. So is it not fair to women when they are the ones who don't have agency and they don't have access? So a two-child norm will not work. And also in, uh, in much of southern part of India, where women are have access to family services, better access and fewer children, why shouldn't we give the same access in UP, Bihar, Rajasthan, Assam, and all these states all where the fertility stuff. rates are high? If women were in school also, they would have fewer children. You know, there is data in India to show that if a girl is that has studied class 12 and above or only class 12, she's likely to have not more than two children. So why yeah. don't we, you know, the, the best concept of education, education. Yeah. and education will also take them forward in their careers, in their economic growth and the country. Mm -hmm. You know, we keep saying there's this demographic dividend, this demographic dividend will become a disaster unless we invest in the literacy skills, etc. of our young people. So it's a win-win situation. Absolutely. And other states did not have a two-child norm and coercive mm -hmm. practices. In India, 20 states didn't have that. So yeah. why should we have anti-women policies? You know, women uh, under the two-child norm will not be able to stand for elections. Women will not get promotions. That's the kind of two-child norm yeah. Yeah. coercion yeah. that and incentives and disincentives we are talking about in this country, which is not necessary. Mm -hmm. When there is a productive, constructive path which is not harmful for women. And finally, Ambika, I want to say that when you enforce a, a, a two-child norm like they did in China, one child and two child, we, they had huge imbalance. They had fewer girls because girls were aborted or feticide, infanticide. And in India, even without having a two-child norm, we have such poor sex ratios. Yes. We have fewer girls, especially in Haryana. Yeah. You know, the girls are being bought for marriage from Assam. We don't yeah. want this situation. Even further, yeah. And in fact, maximum, unfortunately, maximum girls, I mean, child, would we talk about that as well. So it's a very, very, very difficult situation. But like you, you know, were telling us, education is definitely the key. It'll help space out, you know, women will know that, okay, it's good for their health. It's important for them to space out children, how many children to have. Uh, just a question on, are we talking enough of uh, reproductive health at the right age? Are we really normalizing the conversation? Uh, what we should be, you know, talking to children in school at the right age, giving them that information? You know, that is, in fact, the most important after education. Mm -hmm. That is really important, but are we doing it? Not enough. Mm -hmm. We don't have trained teachers, nor do we understand the importance mm -hmm. of sexual and reproductive health. And, you know, it's all about young people's health, yeah. young people not, and their mental health, not just their physical health. Yeah, it's exactly. also about, you know, having safe sex. It mm -hmm. is about, um, postponing when young people have safe sex or sex in general. 
So yes. if you look at countries where they've had sex education, the, the, the first, the age of first sex has got postponed, which is, which is important. And no amount of telling young people don't have sex is mm -hmm. going to change the reality. We know that. So we are in denial in India and we have all these myths and misconceptions that if we give sex education to our children, they will, have, um, they will become promiscuous or have more sex, which is the opposite. In fact, you know, I want to tell you about uh, um, uh, in Bengal, where one of the first NGOs to start a sexual and reproductive health education program, they found, the girls noticed that the boys used to stand outside the um, village and tease them, do eve teasing and almost bordering to harassment. And after sex ed classes, that stopped. So I was a part of that and I said, why don't we do an evaluation to see why? Why may boys stop teasing girls? It's a, because we have to learn so that we can yeah. do it in other places. Do you know what the boys said? They said, you know, we thought girls are some product to be just teased or yeah. sexually, um, sexually attracted we were to them. Mm -hmm. We had no other perception of girls. But after yeah. this sex education, we realized they are equal human beings. And, you know, sex education is not just about sexuality. There's very little in it. People, yes. parents, even parents who object so we must understand it's about gender equality. It's about respecting women. And it's not just about respecting women of the opposite sex who are your age and who are outsiders, but it also leads to greater respect for your mothers, for your sisters, yes. for their well-being, for their, you know, they understand that they need to eat, eat equal amount. So, you know, um, in, in India, it would be great. It will be really in the interest of our country, our people, our mm -hmm. girls and boys. You know, even for boys, they are misled. I mean, yes. you know, teasing girls, sexually abusing girls is something that we need to educate, not to do. We yeah. need to educate and make people realize the consequences. And it also has poor consequences, not only because you get caught, but anybody who abuses another person is somebody, it leads to all kinds of distortion in their personalities, which impact yeah. their ability to study, concentrate on anything, whether it's job, study. In, in every anything. field. Yeah, I mean, everywhere. In fact. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so I'm very glad you raised this. This is a very important question. And it yeah, is because question. it's all connected. It's all connected, yes. right? I mean, so it starts, right. you start feeding your, I mean, you've explained it so beautifully. You, you know, from the beginning, we need to take care of the girl child. It's not just, you know, when she's going to become a mother. So it's a, it's a very well explained. I mean, it's actually a chain reaction. So thank you for explaining that. Just a last question before we go. You know, as part of the NDTV Dijal Banega Swast India campaign, we're moving on to season eight. And our focus here is to leave no one behind, you know. So you have worked with the vulnerable population for many years now. How can we really achieve this? Uh, you know, I mean, it's a huge target. And how do we just manage, like, making sure that we really don't leave anybody behind? So, um, you know, if we are serious about leaving no one behind, there is a very easy way. But it's a policy decision. It's a programming decision that has to be taken. And that is to start with the most vulnerable. You know what we always do? We start helping or treating or giving health services to the better off. You know, district hospitals, in cities, small, large. When it comes to the most remote populations like the tribals and the Dalits, the, who are the poorest and some of the minorities, we, we reach them the last. The yeah. people who have the least are reached the last. So I think we need a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. Let's do a vulnerability assessment and reach the last first. Right. And if we do that, we will, I promise you, we will leave no one behind. And we must. It's not rocket science. We just have to have a vulnerability assessment of who is the most vulnerable. And let me tell you, our bureaucracy, our health bureaucracy, our governance has the capability of doing that. 
but we need to go through this paradigm shift. And again, we need the government to make a political commitment to the most vulnerable, and then no one will let will get that's left. In, that's indeed really, really encouraging. Thank you so much for giving us your valuable expertise and coming on our show. Thank you so much for joining us. Again.